I love it. I love it. I love your faces. I'm so excited that you're here, that you guys have survived the snowstorm of April of 2016. Yes, if you're watching this on the podcast, it's snowing in Michigan. You have to cherish where you are. Um, we're getting by here. I'm so glad that you guys are here. We're kicking off a brand new series called Party On. If this happens to be your first time here, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Brad. I'm one of the teaching pastors. Um, if you've been around for a while, allow me to just assure you that none of the people that you see here on the screen are a picture of Jesus, okay? These are just random 16th century people that we put party faces on. Uh, but this is what the series is about. We're going to talk about this idea of partying because this is what we were thinking about. As a writing team, and we were thinking about the, you know, this series and what we want to preach on, this is what we know is true. We love to party, right? All of us have been to parties. Parties are a part of our culture. It's a part of our lives. I mean, just think about the last party that you went to, right? I mean, what was it for? I mean, we, we party for so many reasons. We have birthday parties, anniversary parties. We have housewarming parties, right? Uh, we even party for, for sad occasions, like, for example, in, in my life, my, uh, our neighbors, we've been living next to them for like eight years now. And uh, we really invited them to be part of our lives. And we've been, you know, kind of like just, we've just real good friends. And they're moving away. And so we're having a going away party uh, for them. And, uh, you know, and that's it's sad, but it's still going to be a time of remembrance. Or you ever think about this? Funerals. Funerals are, it's, you know, it's a, there's a service and there's, you know, the graveside. But then what tends to happen, right? After a funeral service, then usually people go back to someone's house and then they start having a meal and then they start sharing memories. And then it becomes kind of this party of, of, of honoring that person's life and remembering that person's life and what they meant for you. See, whether it's happy or sad, we all individually have these kind of like party moments. And then here's what's interesting to me is collectively we have these kind of community parties, right? We have these things that we say, like, collectively, this is a moment worthy of, of, of celebrating. You know, we, we, most of the time we call them holidays, right? You have your, you know, you have your St. Patrick's Day, you have your Labor Day, you have your Arbor Day, which if you're partying on Arbor Day, you might be partying a little too hard. Um, <laughs> Right? Uh, you have, you know, uh, your, your, your big, your, your Easter's, your Christmas. These are, these are times, whether you're Christian or not Christian, whether you're close to God, not close to God, whether you believe in God or not, as a culture, as a country, we all say we're going to pause and we're going to celebrate. Some people celebrate the risen Christ. Some people celebrate the chocolate bunny. But it's still celebrating, right? And what's interesting is in our culture, these parties kind of get convoluted. That, that, you know, we, we, we know we should party on St. Patrick's Day, but we don't really know why. I think it had something to do with snakes, but let's just make everything green and just go with it. You know, like, uh, or, you know, think about, like, um, if you had to explain Christmas to, like, someone born in western China, you know, in the deepest Buddhist home who had no context of Christ, no context of American culture, could you explain all of the elements that we observe at Christmas and have it make sense. Could you tell them, okay, well, there's a, there was a star of Bethlehem and then, and then the born Christ child, and then there was an elf that you had to put it on the shelf, and then there's this big red guy, and he breaks into your house, but he doesn't take stuff. He puts stuff there and leaves it, and then you take the trees. You know, could you explain all of that in a way that made sense? No, right? So here's the thing. We love the party, and we have these celebrations, but sometimes we forget why we're doing it. And what's interesting is this party culture or this celebration culture or this festival culture begins in Scripture. But for them, it's not this throwaway event. For the people of God, for the nation of Israel, all of these feasts and festivals have great meaning. And, and the way that they party and the way that they celebrate was very, very intentional. That every year when the, these celebrations came around, you would, you would do the exact same things. You would, you, would, you would celebrate the exact same ways. You would sing the exact same songs. You would say the exact same things. You would eat the exact same foods. Because these celebrations weren't just parties. There were moments to remember. Remember who God is. Remember who we are. And remember what God is doing. And so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at some of these specific parties in Hebrew culture. And we're going to show us, show everybody what these say about God and how these still apply to us today. 
So we're going to talk about the Yom Kippur. We're going to talk about the Day of Atonement. We're going to talk about Passover. We're going to talk about these kind of Hebrew customs that, that still have meaning because they point to Christ. But before we, can get to, um, before we can get to any one of those specific celebrations, I have to talk about this, this idea, this, this element that is a part of every single celebration. You see, in Hebrew custom and culture, there's this word that was so important to them. It's called Sabbath. And what it is, it's a day of rest. It's, it's, it's once a week, it's this day of pause. It's this day of just stopping. And every single one of these Hebrew celebrations, the Passover, the home, and all these things, they all start with a Sabbath, and most of them end with a Sabbath. So before we can talk about them, we need to understand what is a Sabbath. Sabbath, the, the word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which literally means to cease, to stop. And the principle of the Sabbath is interesting because you, you see it in Scripture, and it, it, it comes on the scene in Scripture before there's a law, before there's rules, before Moses, before any of this. From the very beginning, God shows us this principle. In fact, if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and get that out because we're going to be looking through this in the book of Genesis. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, under some of the seats in front of you, around you, there should be some Bibles in arm's reach. Feel free to grab one of those. If you don't have a Bible, take it with you. That's our gift to you. But I want you to see some of these scriptures because we're not going to put all of them on the screen. But I want you to see uh, what's happening here. Because to see where the Sabbath comes from, we have to go back to the beginning. Like the beginning, the beginning. Like the in the beginning. Like page one of the Bible, Right? So if you're new and you're like, I don't know how to, just page one, you're good. <laughs> Everybody finds this one good. So, uh, so go ahead and turn to that. Because here's what happens. Genesis chapter 1 is an account of God's creation. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth, sky, stars, plants, animals, mankind. And then Genesis chapter 2 is the culmination of his creation. And look what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. It says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Now here's the $64,000 question. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Why did God rest on the seventh day? He created all this stuff, and here's my question, why did he rest? I mean, do you really think God was tired? I mean, we talk about an all-powerful God. We talk about a God who, you know, who creates, I don't know. We talk about a God who's you know, so vast, and, and do you really think like he was creating everything? He's like, heavens, earth, plants, animals, stars, people. Whoo, I need a Gatorade, electrolytes, you know, like, like <laughs> that probably doesn't, that doesn't make sense. And so I think the resting that takes place on the seventh day has something directly to do with what happened on the sixth day. Because on the sixth day, God creates mankind. He creates male and female. He creates them. And the first thing God does in their presence is to rest. It's almost as if God is giving this object lesson to them. In fact, that, that, that verse 3, look at verse 3 in that Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, it, it wraps up the creation account. It says, then God blessed the seventh day. He made it holy because it, on it he rested from the work of creating that he had done. It's like God was showing Adam and Eve that like, when you rest, it celebrates what I've done. And so you get the idea that in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, that Adam and Eve, they lived this 24-6 lifestyle. That they, they, they weren't, you know, workaholics. They weren't working every day. They weren't, you know, running around. They, 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 they honored this idea of resting because that's what God showed them. And so my question is, are we doing that? Now, here's the deal, and I get it. Because people, you know, I, I, talk, I start talking about Adam and Eve. I start talking about resting and 24-6. People go, yeah. Of course they rested. They had nothing to do, right? They didn't have a job. They didn't have bills, right? They only had two kids. I have four kids. Get on my level, right? <laughs> it wasn't like Eve was like, Adam, can you take uh, a Abel to this travel league in Nineveh? He has a game tonight. And, you know, like, like 
That's the mindset, right? The mindset is they had nothing to do. But what's interesting is that's not true. I don't know if, you, if you've actually ever read you know, these, these verses, but look at Genesis chapter 2. They had stuff to do. See, people think like work was a product of sin. No, work was always part of our human life. Look at, look at verse 15 if you have your Bible open. It says, Then the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Oh, there was a job. There was a physical job. He had to get in there, take care of the garden. We're talking hands and soil. He had to take care of the garden. I just think about that, and I'm like, I am so excited that I was not the first person ever. I would have killed every plant that God put me in charge of. <laughs> like, could you imagine like, the pressure? Like, take care of the garden. Okay, okay. Oh, uh, could you give me one more hibiscus? I promise I won't. I won't overwater the indirect light. It needs to be, I get it now. I got it. Could you like, like, like the this, this stress of that? But they had to take care of the garden. There was physical work to do. Here's what's interesting too. It wasn't just physical work. There was like this idea of like creative work, mental work. It says verse 20, look at verse 20. So the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds in the sky and the wild animals. They had to name every animal that they encountered. How long do you think that would take? How creative, I mean, do you have the creativity to come up with new names for every, I mean, like, at first you had to be like very like, you know, you know, like, okay, all right, horse, bear, buffalo, nailed it, you know? <laughs> and like, the, like week two, month two, he's feeling really, you know, full of himself, ha <laughs> hippopotamus, mm, platypus, you know, like, just like being really creative, you know? But by the end, you'd just be so tired, you're just like rat, bat, cat, gnat, let's just get this done. <laughs> but there was stuff to do. That, that, that's the point. They, they had work. But they, you get the idea they still, they worked in this 24-6 lifestyle. And, and for some of us, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make, it's not in our context because we feel like we have to work harder because our work comes on the other side of sin entering the world. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. This sounds like our work. It says this, to Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and you ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. That sounds like our work. That sounds like what we do. Our work is hard. Whether you're on a factory line, a construction site, or in an office, it feels like we're toiling to get a dollar. It feels like it's by the sweat of our brow that we get the provisions that we need to pay our bills. It sounds like, it's, it's, it sounds like we put the hours into work, but the money is never enough, and so we got to put in more. And what happens in our kind of this, this our natural body state, in our kind of our, our carnal state, we say, I need more provisions. That means I need to work harder. And even this not out of, a, out of a bad thing. I mean, like, I want my children to have a better life than I have, so I need to work harder. My, I want my children to have I want a bigger, bigger house. I need more cars. I need, a bigger, I need to put in more work. Whatever it is, we just have this, this something in us that says I have to work harder, longer, and I have to make sure I have more for myself or my family. And so we throw this idea of rest, rest to the side, this idea of Sabbath to the side. And we said we have to get it done because if we don't do it, no one else has our back. And for God, he's saying, that's, that's not how you were meant to live. That's not what I intended you to be like. Because understand, understand, you know, this idea of Sabbath, this idea of rest, it wasn't just what God demonstrated for us. It's what God commanded us to do. Look in your Bible of Exodus chapter 20. If you're new to church, Exodus chapter 20, this is where you find the top 10, right? This is where, this is where the 10 commandments are in the Bible where, where God tells Moses, this is what the people of God are to do. This is how they are to live. And, of course, you know, he starts off with the big ones, you know, don't kill, don't steal, don't cover. But look at verse 8. Look what, he, look what God says. In the 10 commandments, he says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, and on it you shall not do any work. Neither you, nor your sons, or your daughters, or your male or female servants, nor your animals, or any foreigners residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea, and all, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day. Make it holy. That's, God, that's God's command to his people. He says, you are to observe the Sabbath. You are to regularly pause in your cycle of your life. That wherever you go, that whatever land that you're in, whoever's in your land, the, the, the way that you live your life is going to be a testimony to me. I mean, God is saying, when you pause, when you take a Sabbath, it celebrates what I am doing. Do you realize that? When we pause, it, it shows this world that we are celebrating what God is doing in this world. And that's why, you know, like, you know, you know, you think about Chick-fil-A, right? How many times have you pulled off the interstate on a Sunday and it's like, oh, <laughs> like, I just wanted a sandwich. And every single time, though, that's a testimony that here is a company ran by a Christian man who believes with the word of God. And he's going to close down once a week. And he's not hurting for more. In fact, we're all waiting in Michigan. Get up here. We want one. You know, like, um, God says, when you rest, you're celebrating what I'm doing. When people look at you resting, then, then they, they see in you something different than what they are doing. Like, when your neighbors see you at home just chilling, they're like, what is wrong with them? And it gives us an opportunity to talk about God. Now, here's the thing. I'll be honest with you. I, early on in my life, I did not understand this idea of a Sabbath, this idea of resting. When I was in ministry, I did not fully understand the Sabbath. I remember being in my first ministry, and I was just like, man, I got to get it done. I got to get it. I got I to gotta study the word of God. I need to go visit the sick people. I need to go help, you know, I got to counsel over here. I, you need me to show up there? I'm going to show up there. Like, I need to go this. Whatever it took, I'm like, I'm, I'm on. Whatever you need, God. Because this is the most important thing in the world. I am on, God. Whatever you need me to do, I'm just grinding my wheels trying to get this thing done. And I had, I had no Sabbath in my life, right? And I remember I had a, a wise person, one of, my, one of my people I look up to is just like, man, Brad, you, you have a lot of things going. I'm like, I know, I know, but I'm getting it done for Jesus. You know, I'm getting it done. He's like, how's your family? I don't, I think they're fine. I saw them like a week ago. And so, like, they're like, it sounds like you have a, you know, a lot of things going. I'm like, listen, man, the devil doesn't take a day off, so I need to get this stuff done. And he's like, well, maybe the devil shouldn't be your role model. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> you see, God always intended us to have a cycle of rest. I was listening to a podcast um, a few weeks ago, and uh, I love just listening to random podcasts about random things because um, I'm just fascinated by just everything, really. And uh, this was a podcast. It was a radiologist, and he was talking about, you know, just the art of radiology and, and what they do and, and, you know, how you know, x-rays work and when, how they started and, and all these things like that. And one thing, I, I love this little illustration. He said, and here's the thing. We love, we love finding stuff in people's bodies. Not just because it's funny sometimes, but but like, like but they love it because like it's when you find something in someone's body, that's an easy day at work, right? You you, you do not need a radio, radiology degree to see what's wrong with this X-ray, right? That's <laughs> nailed it, <laughs> like right. Not not only can you tell what's going on in there, you can kind of tell you can tell like you know you can almost put the story together, like you know like you can see kind of oh, oh yep nope. Swallow the ring. Yep, that's what, how that happened. You know, like you get this kind of, you know, sometimes they find stuff in people's bodies. It's a little perplexing. They're just like, I'm not quite sure how that happened. Um, <laughs> that's not real. Um, <laughs> someone's, what is going on? Um, so he's talking about like they love finding things in people's bodies because it's an easy day at work, right? But there are days where you, they have to make their money. So there are days where being an expert pays off. There are days where they get x-rays like this and they have to try to make sense of them. He says, because it's easy. It's easy to tell when there's something in the body that's not supposed to be there. The challenge is, are you aware when there's something missing? Like a right collarbone. That's the challenge with x-rays. And I thought, started thinking about our, my faith. 
I start to think about our walk with God. Because I think if we're being honest, a lot of us, we're kind of open to this idea of growing with Jesus. We're open to this idea of, of growing closer to God. And what we tend to focus on are things in our lives that's not supposed to be there. We say, you know, I, I, I'm struggling with addiction. I know addiction is not supposed to be in my life, so I need to get addiction out of my life. Uh, I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, this, this broken relationship, and I know I was not supposed to meant to have broken relationships, and so I need to get this out. You know. So we focus with these, these things that are in our life, or these things that are broken in our life that need to be fixed or, or removed. But some of us are missing something in our lives that God always intended for you to have. We're missing a cycle of rest. We're missing a pause in our life. We're missing an opportunity to show the world that we trust in God more so than our own hands and efforts and abilities. Let me ask you, do you have rest in your life? Do you observe Sabbath and, and, and rest regularly? Do you find yourself just exhausted and resting from your work? Or are you able to just get up and work out of your rest to be refilled in your relationship with God and then to go back into your workplace as a missionary living out as the hands and feet of God in that place? Because that's the posture that God always meant for us to have. And understand this is important. If, if we're missing this, we're missing part of, the, of who God always meant for us to be. In fact, Exodus chapter 31, I mean, God tells you know, the, the nation of Israel how serious this is. In fact, I love the way the message version of the Bible puts it. It says this, Above all, keep my Sabbaths, the sign between me and you, generation after generation, to keep the knowledge alive that I am the God who makes you holy. Keep the Sabbath. It's, it's holy to you. Whoever performs, profanes it will most certainly be put to death. Whoever works on it will be excommunicated from the people. There are six days for work, but the seventh day is Sabbath, pure rest, holy to God. And anyone who works on the Sabbath will most certainly be put to death. The Israelites will keep the Sabbath and observe Sabbath keeping down through the generations as a standing covenant. Obviously, there's two huge things that sticks out in that. The first to me is this idea of the generations. It says the, it's important for you and me to keep the Sabbath because it, it passes down who God is to the generations. Do you realize the danger? If we get caught up in a 24-7 lifestyle, if we get caught up in only relying on our own ability, only relying on our own you know, effort, if we rely, if we, we, when we get caught up in that, do you know what that, do you know what that does to our children? What are we passing down to our kids? Because I've seen it. I've sat down with high school students and junior high students who are on anxiety medication. I've sat down with kids who already are so stressed out about, I don't know if I, if I get the grades, if I'm not going to be able to get into school, if I'm going to be able to get the job, if I'm going to be able to get enough money to be able to have the lifestyle that my parents have, to meet the expectation my parents have, to meet the what the world has on me. I don't know if I'm going to be able to be enough. And are already paralyzed before their lives or even careers are even starting? Or are we passing down to them rest? That you are a child of God and that God has you and God will provide as he provides for us. The second part of that Genesis 31 is this idea of death. Now, keep in mind, I mean, that's our Exodus 31. I mean, that's, that's the Old Testament, right? And that's, I mean, and the Old Testament was the law. The Old Testament was this is the rule, you follow the rule. And, and, the, and, and the idea was you, you have to keep this. You have to do this. But then something happens in the New Testament. It's interesting, Jesus comes on this earth. And, and, and if, you, if you want to know what, how God feels about anything, just look how Jesus interacts with it in the flesh. Because the way Jesus lived is the way that we are to live. That's how you live in a way that honors God. And Jesus knew Sabbath wasn't, it's never meant to be just about the rule. It's about the relationship. It's about you connecting with God. Because here's the thing, if you're not connecting with God regularly, you are dying. 
You are spiritually waning. You are, you know, you, know, you are, like, you just need that regular connection to God because he is the source of life. And so there's these people in the New Testament called the Pharisees, and they're the rule keepers. And they're like, Sabbath is this day from this time to this time, and you better not go grocery shopping. <laughs> and Jesus says, no, no, no. Sabbath wasn't made for man, or man wasn't made for Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man. Jesus, he, he, I love it, because he comes in and he shows us what Sabbath was always meant to be. Because they thought it was like this one day, and you better not do anything. And re, when you read through the Bible, read through the New Testament, watch what Jesus does on the day that's supposed to be the Sabbath, the day that's supposed to be the Holy Jesus will take some grain, and he'll be like, don't do anything like this. And he'll start doing some work on the Sabbath that day. Jesus will see a blind man, and he says, oh, so you're not supposed to do anything on this day? Nothing like this? Whop! And just make him see, you know? But then, but then there's other scriptures, like Matthew 8, where it says, Jesus, the Son of God, took a nap. There's scripture after scripture where it says that Jesus went away from the crowd. That, that he went away to be with God. He rested. Even in his ministry, in his short three years of, of his active ministry on this earth, he took regular time and rest. It wasn't about the specific day. It's about having a moment, having, having these, these, these times of connection with God where you're not caught up in what you're doing, but you're caught up in the relationship with God. So here's my question. Do you have a cycle of rest in your life? Do you have Sabbath in your life? And if you're missing it, then maybe you're missing the completeness of how God always meant for you to live. And here's the thing where I, I know it's true. If you don't have Sabbath, if you don't have rest, it's probably for one of two reasons. Either one, your pride. Your pride. I, I have to work, otherwise work won't get done. I have to, I have to be the one doing it, or else, you know, otherwise it's going to fail. I have to be doing my part in the kingdom of God, or else God won't advance his kingdom. It's either pride, or it's lack of trust. I have to work, otherwise God won't be there. I have to work, otherwise we won't have enough. I have to work, otherwise nobody is looking out for me. Here's what I want you to do. On the right-hand side, there's another bucket that has a magnet in it. And I want you to take that. Go ahead and pass it through the aisles. Go ahead and take one of those magnets. Uh, this, this is kind of like our gift to you. I want you to take these home. You can slap it on your fridge. In front of you, there should be some Sharpies in the seat backs in front of you as well. On that magnet, it says this little statement. I can rest because God can. And there's a blank. And here's what I want you to do as this, a, a testimony of who God is, as a reminder for who you were meant to be. I want you to think about what keeps you from resting in God. And I want you to know that whatever it is, God can cover that. And maybe you need to fill in that blank just with an honest, honest statement of who God is. And what you write may be different than what the person next to you write or what your family members write, but this is for you, your connection with God. Maybe some of you, you need to remind yourself, I can rest because God can protect me. I can rest because God can provide. I can rest because God can forgive me. I don't know what, what specifically you need to write down, but, but, but maybe you just need to remind yourself that God has this under control. And that your rest celebrates what God is calling us to do in this world. That is to trust and live for him.